So, uh, Rabble, yep. uh, one of the most exciting things for me, for someone who's been involved in Nostar for quite a while, is coming to this conference, Nostar Rica, and then meeting people such as yourself, who I sort of see as a, a very legit person, who has <laughs> done a lot of things in the past, um, but some people uh, might not know um, what you've worked on in, in the past, so could you, could you just give a brief explain as to who you are and what you've worked on? Sure, so uh, I'm Rabble, I'm a software developer and hacker, and I was part of the team that created Twitter. And I hired Jack into the company and provided the SMS parts and the, the telephony parts that became Twitter. And since then, I've spent time at a, working at Yahoo uh, with different product innovations at the MIT Media Lab, and I always wanted to revive the open protocol decentralized dream of Twitter that we had in the first few years that was lost. And so I've been very interested in emerging protocols because I've tried every one, and I, and, and I tried to figure out what worked and what made them successful, both the technology and the people. And that's how I got excited about Noster. Nice, because you had a project you've recently been working on where you were using Scuttlebutt yeah. for a few years. I've been working on Scuttlebutt for the last four years, actually. Oh, well, nice. Uh, Secure Scuttlebutt is a peer-to-peer uh, -peer decentralized offline first social media protocol, and it's one of the inspirations for Noster. But it, it changes some things. Um, that uh, caused it not to take off. So Scuttlebutt is entirely immutable, and um, you sign the entire chain. So in Scuttlebutt, uh, you can't multi use multi-device, and you can't delete, and you have to directly connect to people's things through a gossip network as opposed to relays. Yeah. So when I saw Noster, I was like, oh, this is Scuttlebutt, but with Noster. some stuff fixed. <laughs> yeah. And my stuff fixed wasn't even the Lightning Network and, and the ability to do financial transactions. It's other parts of Noster that I was super excited about. Yeah, and I think that's really important as well because I, I was saying to you earlier today that early on in the Telegram group, some people got booted because they were talking too much Bitcoin. And our, our fear was that it would scare off a lot of very good developers because they would just see it as a Bitcoin project. And although it's been something which was developed by Bitcoiners, I think it's important that Bitcoin almost doesn't become too entangled. Personally, I feel it should be too entangled. I mean. It, for some applications, it definitely makes sense with Lightning Network, with micropayments. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's something dear to my heart as well, that Nostar is its standalone, standalone thing, and then you know, Bitcoin can complement it. Um, but with your, your, your software, I mean, it, how, long, how long have you been implementing Nostar instead of Scuttlebutt in the back end? So uh, I saw, first saw stuff on Nostar. Uh, people on Scuttlebutt were discussing Nostr oh, wow. about a year ago. Wow, that's cool. And uh, because people using Scuttlebutt are interested in decentralized open protocols. But it was one of many protocols. Um, and then uh, in October, before Elon Musk took over, I went back to our team, and we have a small startup building decentralized social media apps. Sure. I went back to the team at Planetary and I said, no, there's something interesting in Noster, and maybe we should look at it more seriously. Then Noster blew up yeah. and got a lot of attention, and Jack got excited about it, yeah. um, which I thought was interesting because I've been involved with the Blue Sky Project since before it was announced. Yeah. And we did a serious evaluation I remember. Yeah. in December about Noster, Blue Sky, Scuttlebutt, how does it work? In January, we produced a, an article analyzing, from a technical perspective, the pluses and minuses of Scuttlebutt and Noster. And uh, then we decided to pivot, ramp down our development of Scuttlebutt apps, and build a new Noster app as an experiment. And that's proved to be a very successful experiment. And so now we've pivoted to, to building on Noster. Fantastic. So with the, the Scuttlebutt community, is that, is I mean, is that something of a bone of contention with them that you're now working on Nostar stuff? Is a competition from, because I mean, that's got a well-established uh, decentralized protocol for, for communication, um, but it is kind of slow and, and, and it, there is definitely a, a Scuttlebutt community, isn't there? Yes. How are they taking that? So the interesting thing is the Scuttlebutt community has, uh, all of the developers of the major Scuttlebutt apps yeah. have come to the conclusion that Scuttlebutt has actually reached the 
it's useful as a social network, and it's useful as a community, but uh, it needs a new version. Yeah. So what's happening now in Scuttlebutt is uh, the apps, by various different developers, are going into more of a maintenance mode. The community is continuing, and we're all going and looking at new protocols and new stuff. And uh -huh. so. There's a project by Andre Stoltz who created Miniverse to create a Scuttlebutt 2.0, which includes many ideas from Noster. Wow. Um, and uh, and some Scuttlebutt ideas, and you know, so what what's happened in Scuttlebutt is like we learned a lot, we innovated a lot. Uh, Scuttlebutt's first version comes from 2012, yeah. and the world has changed. Yeah. And so Scuttlebutt needed a non-backwards compatible fork yeah. and um, so when we said oh we're going to stop doing scuttlebutt development and work on on Noster there was disappointment but also the scuttlebutt community is like now's the time to build new stuff yeah so there and wasn't a, the there wasn't a lot of like super negative backlash yeah I mean and also the, the world needs a Twitter platform yeah basically so and that's something which you couldn't build on scuttlebutt the, the, no because scuttlebutt is a uh, one author described it as slow social media. Yeah, yeah, which is fine, and a lot of people enjoy it for, for what it is. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, like can, with what's been happening with Twitter, like clearly the world needs new Twitter, and and also is the way to go on that. Well, it's nice that they're embracing um, uh, new technologies, new, new approaches, and then could probably incorporate that into Scott, but and then keep that project moving and and and, and progressing as well. That's good to hear. Um, so have you, uh, you've enjoyed the conference, Costa Rica? The, this, this Costa Rica's conference has been fantastic. Yeah, it has been amazing. Uh, it? It, it's amazing when you first get a community of people together yeah. who've been connecting online and a new project and they all meet for the first time. It reminds me of the first Ruby on Rails conference where we'd been talking on IRC and we'd been building cool stuff, but we never met in person. Yeah. And um, you know, that Ruby on Rails conference we were all just hackers, and we were all collaborating. But uh, Tobias Lucas, Lucas from who created Shopify, yeah. was there. Uh, the GitHub founders were all there. A ton of other people went on to build platforms and software that changed the world. I remember I was speaking to your friend about this, who attended the, the, those first Ruby uh, meetups. Yeah. Um, and he was saying you know, there's like a dozen people in the room, and it was those people who went on to build these platforms which everyone uses um, and uh, I think sometimes you have a moment in time where there's lots of people with a shared interest and then they meet in a sort of they have a meeting or a meetup or a conference in a shared meet space and then it's almost like they, they fan inward they meet and then there's this huge explosion this kind of an explosion of innovation and um, we had it with the the lightning network hack days yeah um, which uh, the Fulmo team in Berlin organized and I, we ha I went to the first hack day. In fact, it was the first Bitcoin conference I think I went to, and it was the exact same energy. It was lots of very enthusiastic, very clever people um, with a bunch of amazing ideas, uh, which they could work off for the next few years uh, and not have to come up with any other ideas, and you would still come out with a bunch of cool projects. Um, so yeah, that, that energy, it's, it happens rarely, but I think maybe you're right, it's like the, the birth of a, so I suppose Ruby was young at that time. Ruby was young and Ruby on Rails yeah. was considered a, a radical um, sort of punk disestablishment crazy way to build web applications, yeah. which now Ruby on Rails is a very legacy way of building heavy web applications. But at the time... Why was it so important though? Because all, all it was doing was m meaning so you didn't have to replicate work more, more or less, wasn't it? Yes, but, but that, that went against all the ideology of Java. Uh, so Java was the dominant way of the right way of doing programming and web development where you would write out your getters and setters and everything was explicit and, and very long form and you didn't do any trickery or magic and yeah. it took forever to program because you had to write thousands of lines of code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the only way to... Can you imagine a world built on Java? We'd still be... <laughs> well, the Java world believed that the only good interchange format was XML. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. So, you know, we have JSON today because of Ruby on Rails and JavaScript frameworks making that like so easy yeah. because we were throwing all the rules out. And I feel like today we're doing something similar. Like, like we're like, what if 
what if there's a way to recombine these things in a radically simpler way that makes it easy to, to innovate and to experiment? That's why there are like a hundred Nostra clients. Yeah, and, that, and the permissionless development side of Nostra is something which I'm really interested in because you know, like we made our little signing device, device and it took us like four days of hacking and we had a little signing device for Nostra. And then I think how hard would that be to create for something like Twitter? Um, but uh, Twitter, is, it, it was your baby, wasn't it? It was something yes. you were heavily involved in. So how does it feel that it went the way it did? And, and early on in Twitter, did you expect that it could happen? Or um, uh, was, do you think there would be anything back then you could have done to prevent it going the way it did? I mean, it's still, it's still, it's still a great platform, of course, um, but just it may be too dependent upon who owns the platform, I think. So uh, Twitter... Twitter is near and dear to my heart. Yes. Um, I feel incredibly lucky to be in the room, part of the team that figured out and created it. It's fun to tell that story. What people don't realize is that, like, everybody thought we were stupid. Like, everybody thought Twitter was the most asinine, stupid social media platform. And that we were dumb to build it because we'd been working on podcasting before that. Then people started using it. Yeah. And they just like, well, maybe we weren't so stupid. Yeah. But, no, but that was my exact Twitter experience. For years, I kind of put off using Twitter. And I thought, this stupid hashtag and this ads. And, the, and it was like, I had this like, um, I don't know, like it's aversion to it because it seems so counterintuitive to what I would had, had used before. But then when I did use it, I was like, wow, this is really easy. It doesn't require much time in a day. And you have one profound thought a day and put that on Twitter. And then, you know, people like it. and you get good feedback and it's a nice way to kind of share ideas. Yeah, so people loved it or hated it and those who loved it got super addicted. I mean, I remember at one point there were 100 active users on Twitter and there were 100,000 tweets delivered per month. Wow. And it, that's crazy. Yeah. And like it never had happened before. But we th we thought of Twitter, we were we were developers and so the Twitter API just sort of came naturally. The Twitter bot so that you could chat via Twitter came naturally. And then we were like, well, we had a Twitter bot that let you interact with it with Jabber, like the XMPP clients. What if instead of a user doing that, you could build applications on top of that? Mm. And so we had a REST API, but we also were really into Jabber. And then what if we use that to sync between systems? Between So at one point in 2007, 2008, Twitter was federated federated on an open protocol. Well, that's cool. So you could you could do a post on Jaiku and then follow someone on Twitter and vice versa. Wow. But Twitter was growing very, very quickly. Twitter did not have a business model. That was the joke. Biz Stone is the founder of Twitter and he does they don't have a business model. Yeah. And XMPP wasn't the right choice. Yeah. And you know the irony is I gave a talk at OSCON in 2007 where I explained how we were gonna federate Twitter and how we could build federated protocols on Jabber. And uh, Roy Felding, who wrote the, you know, the paper that became REST, and like all West, West, RESTful web services come from this stuff, he basically got up and said that we were wrong and that we were a mistake and we were choosing the wrong technical path. Mm -hmm. And then Brad Fitzpatrick, who uh, created Memcache and LiveJournal, also got up and said, we were wrong. And we were wrong. Like XMPP fell apart. Eventually Google and others who were using XMPP as open chat protocols walked away and the XMPP community had to rewrite into matrix. So choosing the wrong technical substrates mm. and protocols doomed it. And the, there was no indication that the rest stuff would work. Like there was no, there was no, there was enterprise pub sub, but there was no like open pub sub systems, web hooks, things like that. And so Twitter lost its openness. And a lot of us in the early days mourned that loss. The rest of the world didn't even know it had happened. Mm -hmm. But we kept looking for ways to build that open alternative. Oh, so it was at that loss when the Blue Sky Initiative kind of started to brew and... No, no, so this, this loss happened when, you know, when Ev took over as CEO of Twitter. This is back in 2009, 2010. Okay, yeah, well. And then we had the open APIs and these third-party Twitter apps, and then that, that went away in 2012. And 
Then when Jack came back as CEO, he revived the Twitter developer conferences and tried to bring it back and made Twitter survive, but it still wasn't there. And then Mike Masnick wrote this article, Protocols Over Platforms, mm -hmm. where he says, the Web 2.0 companies ended up taking what should have been open protocols and made them into closed platforms. And so the solution going forward is to revive this. And that got larger attention. And so um, there have been a group of us working on this before that article, but that article was, was super important. And that's what was enough, including me going back to Jack and saying, no, no, this needs to be an open protocol. I'm building this thing on Scuttlebutt. And we had discussions about whether or not Twitter would invest in Scuttlebutt. Like, and the decision was that Scuttlebutt wasn't the right platform, but the Twitter should spin off a project that became Blue Sky I see. to build an open protocol vision and sort of that's like revive the dream of the revolution that yeah. you know yeah. it had gone wrong. So like, it always kind of felt counterintuitive that you would be having a business, uh, you know, Twitter, and then you would create um, a protocol. Uh, um, blue Sky or something would come out of Blue Sky, which would then replace Twitter. So what, what you're actually saying is it was the way in which to build the, the tools so you could put it underneath bit, uh, Twitter and have Twitter run on top of it. Yes. So Twitter was supposed to be a Blue Sky client. I see. And then Twitter was going to use all of its expertise in spam detection and advertising market, algorithms on feeds, user recommendations, media hosting, there's a payment infrastructure there. They were going to use all that as part of the open blue sky ecosystem. And the argument would be that Twitter shouldn't be the only fish in a small pond, but rather Twitter should be the, the creators of the ocean and have many businesses within it. Yeah. And many other people could do business within that space. Yeah. And Elon said that it's, that's what he was going to do. Yeah. That's, I think, the, you know, the, that was the, the promise, wasn't it? That, that was yeah. the promise. Yeah. The, there was two options. Hedge fund people were going to come in and take over Twitter, or Elon could take it over. Yeah. And if the hedge fund people had taken over, Twitter was going to have to do layoffs, and it would have been bad. And Elon said he wanted it open. He wanted to open source it. He wanted to do this open thing. And... Evidently, that didn't happen. <laughs> well... Yeah, I the mean, exact yes, opposite yes, happened. Maybe, who knows. And, <laughs> and he took over, and no one expected him to handle it so poorly yeah. that it's almost as if you have to ask, was he trying to torpedo the company yeah. and create space for outside alternatives? Yeah, yeah, it does feel that way. It's almost, I mean, you can just put it on a local level. Like if you, have, you have like a thriving, successful restaurant, and then someone buys it, and then they radically change it. And you think, well, why did you buy that restaurant? You could have just made a new restaurant. If you didn't want that restaurant, don't buy it. And that's kind of how I feel with Twitter. Like, it's a very functional, great platform. Buy it. Don't do anything revolutionary and just slowly, slowly, like maybe start implementing some things, but try and keep it as, you know, as, as similar to its old um, state that it was, you know, um, uh, as, you, as you take it forward. But yeah, it's a great shame because I, I, I love Twitter. And maybe even though we weren't aware that the, the I always knew that Jack Dorsey from quite early on that Jack Dorsey was like a legit dude and he was in it because of the technology. Because I remember watching a, a few podcasts with him or something and I remember yeah. thinking, I remember being very impressed with him um, and he was a kind of hacker guy, you know, and interested in the technology. Um, but maybe that energy um, which you guys had in the back end while you're building this, twi while you're building Twitter, maybe that managed to filter into Twitter because I found that Twitter was, was the platform for people um, who also shared that energy. Twitter, Twitter, even though it ended up being a closed, centralized platform, embodied an open nature. Yeah. So at the company, when it was founded, um, there was a blurry line about who was an employee. Like this was before widespread co-working spaces and all sorts of people would just come hang out and work from our office. And they would work on Twitter and they would work on Odeo. And then they would go back and be like, you know, is this guy Dunstan working for us? No, like his day job is redesigning the apple.com homepage, but he's bored with that. So he works. Yeah, he works in your office. Yeah, and works in our office and, 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 and contributes. And there were lots and lots of people like that. Yeah, and fantastic. that led to a culture yeah. that valued the outside and valued the community. So 
uh, the word tweet, uh, hashtags, at replies, retweets, tweet streams, um, inline images, inline video, uh, short links, every search, everything we think of, trending topics, everything we think of as Twitter was not invented by the company of Twitter. It was all invented by the users and the developer community, and then Twitter supported it. Mm. So all Twitter had to do to be innovative was like the convene the space, users, users, yeah. convene the space, respect the users, yeah. and that's why it feel felt like like Twitter didn't feel like their thing. Yeah, like Twitter felt like our thing. Yeah, yeah, it didn't feel like you were using some sort of corporate platform. It felt like you were. You did feel like you were using something fairly open, which is I think why a lot of the Bitcoin community found a home on Twitter. Absolutely, um, thousands of communities found homes on Twitter. Oh yeah, absolutely, and that, and that was was also great about Twitter because I think it is important that when you're using a kind of universal platform that you can still enjoy a space with people who share have shared interests, you know, or interest in the technology you're into or interest in whatever. Um, uh, but do you think that that, that, could, that same experience could be achieved in, in Nostra where people can find each other um, in that global feed and you can build up those kind of communities? Because um, if, you, if you're part of certain communities, then your Twitter will, that's why that, it will be just filled with those people and that'll be your experience. Yeah. It's almost like a custom platform for your community, you know? Yeah. So I don't, I don't think the global feed will continue to work in Nostra as something particularly useful. No. And I don't think it works now. No, it just happens that to be that we're. It used to work Bitcoin like four months ago, yeah. five months ago, when there were thousands of people using Noster. Mm. The global feed was super important and super useful, but once there become hundreds of thousands of people, the global feed isn't that useful. But that's part of what worked in Twitter too, because you had the people you followed. But someone who you aren't following could reply, and it had this sort of semi-open nature. It wasn't closed groups like Facebook groups mm. or like email lists. It was semi-open and I could post something and I don't have to see your posts. Mm. I can only see the replies. But if I put the username at the beginning, then only the people who we see in common see the post. Oh, so it had right. the, I never really knew how that worked. I always thought it was the only the person I, I was talking about would see the post. That's how Mastodon works. Uh, but okay. in Twitter, when you put the at reply at the beginning, it's a super subtle feature. Yeah. Then the only people who see the post are the people that we know in common. Oh, I see. That makes and sense. And so it creates super easy, casual intimacy. Yeah. And so we still need to figure out how, that, how to recreate that aspect in Nostra. But I think that um, I think we can solve these problems. I think we can solve the problems of spam. I think we can solve the problems of like someone coming from Truth Social and someone coming from Black Lives Matter and being able to use the space to communicate with them with their own communities. Mm. Not semi open, so like there are there are permeable boundaries, mm. but also where the norms of speech and the norms of behavior for those different communities, for sex workers and church groups can yeah. be um, maintained. So we need to build both openness and the ability for communities of people to say, this, this is our community. I think this is important that, I mean, so we, we, we live in a world where the algorithms are generally not good for us as individuals. Yeah. Um, but in order for Nostar to work and have a similar Twitter experience, the similar experience to Twitter, we do need some form of algorithm oh, we... to, to filter information. <laughs> So what sort of proposals, have you got any proposals on how that you could best do that in, in a global feed? I think um, we spoke about, was it you I spoke to about uh, have just having just a few degrees of separation? So the, the Nostra app that, that I've built, Nost.social, yeah. has that by default. It's like you join, you follow people, you find people, and your primary feed is those posts. And then we have a, an explore tab, which is like the global feed, but you, by default, see two degrees out, and you can, you'll be able to set it three or four degrees out. And so if someone isn't in your social graph, you don't see their stuff. And you can change it to view all the posts by a specific relay, so like we don't lock the doors on you, yeah. but we do give you doors and windows so that you can have a sense of space. And I think that 
uh, relays and future private groups and other things like that are going to let people choose to set up their own boundaries and choose to decide where the groups are and things like that and choose to and empower them to decide. Well, that's just the same as censorship in Nostar. It's, that it's not that we don't have censorship, but it's a user-driven censorship. And if they yeah. don't want to go to certain areas, then they don't have to go to certain areas. And Because um, censorship, when it's a government or a corporation, a corporation or, that you have no accountability for, you don't see the rules, that that's one thing. But choosing who you're talking to and who hears your conversations and who's getting to participate, that's, you know, some people say that censorship, but that's also like, like autonomous self-governance. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. No, I'm very much in line with that. And I think it's like a town is a good analogy. There's some streets which you had them walk down, they're too rough, you know, and, and that's what we can have in Nostar, um, that your, your world, which you expose yourself to, uh, it could be quite vanilla, or it could be, you know, with this, being this interest or that interest. And then it, it also applies to, to moderation. You know, if you, I personally would um, connect to a bunch of very vanilla relays, because uh, I don't want to see like gross stuff, which is going to, you know, I'm quite squeamish. Um, whereas some other people might, they might be a bit more macabre, they might want to see some gross stuff, so they could connect to a different type of relay. And then if people put anything on there which is really inappropriate, then it would be up to traditional, you know, law enforcement, whatever, to try and track down the people running those relays and, and shut them down. But I feel like it's a good model going forward because you, you can't have just a completely uncensored feed. Yeah, and, and this, you know, there are some Noster folks who want, like, things to be unremovable. Yeah. And what I tell them is, like, secure Scuttlebutt, the protocol I was working on before this, the data structures are immutable. There is, there is like, there is no way that the, the, the protocol can remove stuff. But I think that's a mistake. Yeah. And um, the reality is that we live in a world where there are governments yeah. that make laws. And some governments have no restrictions on speech. And some only make things like child pornography illegal. Others uh, restrict things like Nazi symbols and discussions. Others, you know, are super conservative about sex or insulting the king. Yeah. In Thailand, you can't insult the king. Yeah. So uh, users of Noster who live in Thailand, they need to be able to use this where they're not putting hosting jokes about the, putting themselves yeah. at risk yeah. inadvertently. Yeah, that's true. Because all of a sudden they're sharing jokes about the king of Thailand. Like, I couldn't care less if you joked I mean, about the king the, of Thailand. The, the but, point being that if they wanted to, they could easily connect to a relay where they could, you know. Yeah, if they want to specific, take that, yeah. if they want to take that risk. That's a, a user choice. They should go for their civil disobedience and make fun of the king. Yeah, yeah. We're um, stop them. And nothing's to stop them. But uh, what we need is to empower the autonomy of people and communities to make those decisions themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what attracts us to it as a model. Um, and I, I, I like the ephemeral nature of notes just inherently because, I mean, currently some relays store all the notes, but that couldn't continue forever because when you get lots of users in Nostar, then they would need big servers. And then how are they going to pay for those servers? Well, they, maybe they'll turn to an advertising model. And maybe for some users, they would opt into that. Um, but for some other users, they won't want an advertising model. Maybe they'll connect to a relay where they can pay to have some things stored. Um, and I, I think it leaning towards ephemeral notes which probably disappear after a period of time because no one's going to store it for you. I almost don't feel like that's a bad thing. Like I think one of the... the, the I think it's a really good thing. Yeah. It's one of the things that makes me most excited about Noster over Scuttlebutt and some of the other protocols is I can set an expiry date yeah. on my posts. Yeah. So we're going to build a feature where you can go in and say, by default, uh, request that relays stop hosting the content after 30 days. Yeah, great. And also on the specific post message, is this a post that I'm asking to stay around forever? Yeah. Is this one that should only be around for a day? I was thinking the exact same thing, how cool it would be to have a client where the default is that it's ephemeral, maybe just even two days, then their notes will just disappear. But in the, if you have something, like if you're gonna put down something which you want recorded and you feel like you want it time stamped or you want it you know, to last, then there'd be some sort of way of, of posting it and then you would be you'd be saying, no, actually, can you keep this one for, yeah. for as long as possible, please? Yeah, and um, then and then then you keep the ones because 
like look at old tweets. Oh man, I use Twitter in the past. I used Twitter a lot for I have an idea. I'm pretty sure no one else has thought of it. I don't want to just get it in there, timestamp it. So later on, when someone else has the idea and does something, I can say, oh yeah, I originally had that idea actually. Thank you very much. Um, and I, so, so yeah, I think a lot of people use Twitter like that as a way of recording information I mean, in time. I, I used it because you know Trump was doing detaining kids at the border, and someone was like, oh, you're just complaining because it's Trump. And so I went and I found an old tweet, tweet complaining about what Obama was doing to kids at the border as well. Yeah, yeah. And like that was useful. Yeah. But many times those old posts are taken out of context and used in a way that's a sort of crowd sort of madness around what is called cancel culture. Yeah. And like sometimes there's massively inappropriate behavior, but sometimes those old messages go after people <laughs> in ways that don't make any sense at all. And, and so we should have the option of just having a tweet. I have a bunch of friends who use services that delete their tweets after 30 days, but they have wow. to do a paid service for that. That's ridiculous, isn't it? Um, the, the, um, I think that one of the issues with Twitter for me was it was trying to simulate kind of a conversational format, so you know, mm -hmm. short sentences, but yet stuff was stored forever. So you know, I'm in the pub, I'll say something stupid, the next day I feel bad about it, I might say to my friends, I'm sorry about that, and I say, I don't worry, it was yesterday, and it's gone, you know, no one thinks of it. Everyone does that, humans do that. Um, and then when they're speaking, they speak quite freely. And then when most people, when they're on Twitter, on a platform like that, where they appreciate that the, the information will be stored forever and they could be accountable for it, they'll, um, they, they'll be very careful in what they say. So when they publish, it will be you know, well-prepared, thought out, thoughtful. Um, and then you get in, within that framework, you get someone like Trump who just says whatever he thinks. And then he feels almost more real like, because he's speaking like people speak in the pub. You hear people speaking on the street or something. Sure, because he's not, he's not protecting. He's not, he doesn't care. Not, yeah. He doesn't care about how he might be pulled up on some tweet later on. So, and, but that then gives them this, this, this sort of power that they almost c come out of the woodwork as, as being more real. Do you know what I mean? And because authenticity matters. Yeah. Because now we can see so much of each other's lives and so much was going on. And so what, what was, you know, celebrities used to be at arm's length. Yeah. And one of the things that Twitter did is it made you feel like you were in the room with them. Yeah. I used to, to say that Twitter was useful for tell, writing and sharing things that weren't important enough to tell your friends when you hung out with them. Yeah. And then now yeah, Twitter is more important, but it's that sort of, and that's ephemeral stuff of like, oh shit, it's raining or isn't yeah, that a right, beautiful flower? Because that's how Twitter was used, wasn't it? Quite yeah. early on. Yeah. yeah. And then it started to become more... People were more thoughtful and profound in where they were tweeting. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah, you look at my old tweets or Jack's old tweets. They're like... Yeah, it's stupid. It's like I'm eating a lobster. Oh, yeah. yeah. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, what other applications for Nostar? Are you, is there any other application? Because we've been working on, in Alan Bits, we've been working on the Nostar market, um, which has partly had a hand in, in the, the beginning of Nostar and the Nostar, uh, the Nostar protocol, the concepts of um, markets, you know, smart clients, dumb servers, rather than smart servers, dumb clients. And uh, do, you, do you feel that there will be more growth in that area of other applications in, in the NOS, using the NOSTA infrastructure? Absolutely. My, my, I mean, we're building a social app. Uh, it, the NOSTA primary posts are short form, not structured, but there's the ability to do longer form markdown posts. Yeah. I'm super excited about that. Mm -hmm. I think that we can build things that are socially collaborative. Like, you can use CRDTs and uh, collaborative social scoping of posts to make a, a global personal wiki where your vision of what you see is different from mine, is different from someone else's, but I'll see the posts and the comments and the, the edits from the people in my social sphere and someone far away doesn't do it. So then you don't have the edit wars that exist in Wikipedia. Um, I think if we get it right, we get to rebuild all social software. Wow. We get to rebuild all software on this way in which the servers are just relaying content and the rules of the software are driven by these local databases. Because that's, you know, even if it's just- that's what empowers, that's, if you have a smart server and a dumb client, then- The, the power is in the, the server. Exactly, the, and the, the administrator of the server. Whereas this flips it and it's the powers with the user. Um, and so I actually think 
that if, if it works and we keep doing it, we actually get to replace most software Good God. that has multiple people collaborating. And that's huge yeah. because we replaced most software when we switched to these web browsers that held everything and just gave us the, the interface application over JavaScript. And this inverts it and makes it more possible to build social software because almost every software like is social, like a document editor is social. Um, now we get to invert that process again. And that is one of these decade long pendulum swings of software between centralization and decentralization that's been going on since the 1950s. So, you know, yes, maybe it's marketplaces and social apps and wiki things, everything else, but what is, what is Figma mm. for design collaboration mm. or Photoshop over Nostra? Or Uber or whatever. Or Uber or, uh, you know, dating apps. Yeah. And we're building, we have so much research into privacy preserving machine learning. And we've now discovered that giving all of our data to a few large companies is a terrible idea. Yeah. But what's worse than the data we're giving them is them getting to decide whether or not we're connected. Yeah. Like, you know, Figma could decide that they didn't want you in my design document that I was sharing. And I have no, there's nothing I can do. I think like, you get, cause you get like a, a they can take your name away. They, they can take your friends away. Yeah, they have like this interesting and beautiful platform like, like Twitter and with all these great, you know, aspirations um, to be open. Uh, and then like within Bitcoin, we had local Bitcoins very similar when it started. It was just this platform, which was just allowed for these peer to peer, -to -peer trading between, you know, someone who wants to buy some Bitcoin, and someone who has some Bitcoin. And that's recently gone down because over the years it had to become more and more um, like its users had less and less freedom. Whereas now I think someone in the conference said we could just build local Bitcoins on Nostar and we totally could. Like you're just connecting two people um, uh, and you could have like a geolocation event type or something. You could just have two people and you just and you're connecting them. And it's almost like you, you're now given the tool, this thing which someone had a great idea to build, like Twitter, like for Twitter, for example, this wonderful idea. But. The, the tooling wasn't quite there. The, 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 the foundation wasn't quite there, you know? Did you know that Twitter had this thing called annotations that were data tweets that weren't text? And you could do data streams of structured data that was JSON. Wow. Either attached to tweets that you could see or invisible ones. And that would have opened up this entire world of of social apps. But Twitter decided that they were a media company and that they needed to control the environment in order to sell ads and that ads were the only viable business model. Elon Musk is trying to figure out whether or not he can alienate all the advertisers so they can survive without ads. But, <laughs> um, and so we had, we had the starts of that. And when there was, you know, one thing people have talked here about Nostrica is Every idea that could be tried will be tried. Yeah. And that out innovates any corporation. Oh, yeah. The permissionless development. It's just like the same in free and open source software. Um, uh, you can just build. You can take a project, fork it, build. And over time, it's inevitably going to outpace the proprietary system. Absolutely. Yeah. Even, if, even if the open source way makes usability harder and everything else, we, we, we don't need permission. No. And the protocol is self-certifying. Yeah. Like when, when uh, Jay Graber, who, who runs Blue Sky, wrote this great essay called What is Web3? Yeah. And she was like, cryptocurrency projects and tokens and smart contracts, those are Web3. Bitcoin is Web3. But there also are all these other protocols that are Web3. And those are protocols that are permissionless and self-certifying. So Scuttlebutt, no blockchain, no cryptocurrency, is a self-certifying protocol. Mm -hmm. Noster, no blockchain, no cryptocurrency. Yeah. Like you can link references to lightning wallets and, and transactions, but the protocol operates without it. Which is great for us because I think- And it's self-certifying yeah. and it's permissionless and it's empowering. Yeah, and it's great for us because I think that often people got Bitcoin too conflated just with public key crypto. 
Yeah. And it's like you can fix all these problems with public key crypto and they would think that they needed to create some blockchain or some, you know, some in extra infrastructure, extra complicated infrastructure. When the reality was, it's just that users having access natively to a private key and a public key. And, you know, and then we had this whole, you know, new tokens and ICO madness and everything yeah, else. Yeah, and, I, and, and, you know, even Bitcoin's price rose all this level and everything else. And then, you know, in some ways, the money funded lots of development and work. And there are some really good tech projects out there. And Noster uses a bunch of that tech that got developed. So does uh, IPFS. So does a ton of other protocols. But it was a distraction, too. Yeah. And it distracted people away from solving people problems and instead was solving how do I make money problems. Yeah. And so I like that Noster doesn't have a token. In fact, if it had a token or yeah, had, you had to, if, if, if you had to do a payment yeah. to use it, I wouldn't use it. No, I, wouldn't. I would never have considered using it. No. Um, and But the self-certifying nature, the permissionless nature, means that you don't have to ask someone else. Twitter, early on, was permissionless. Mm. Did you know this? No, no. So the, uh, the first several years of Twitter apps, Twitter had no idea if someone was a person or an app because there was no distinguishing using Twitter from their RESTful API or as a web user because of the web front end connected to the same RESTful API. And you could either use cookies or you could authenticate with Auth Basic if the user's username and password. So in the early days, you didn't have to register an app. You didn't have to ask for permission. Anybody who wanted to build on Twitter could, even though the XMP3 thing failed, anyone who wanted to build an app on Twitter could because there was no control around that. And the mm -hmm. irony is that OAuth was created for Twitter. Was it really? Yes, it was created oh. by Blaine Cook, who was the lead developer on Twitter. He built the API, the app reply, the structure scaled all the things first early years. And he created OAuth based on ideas from Flickr's token auth and other things like that. Yeah. But he made it a standard because he wanted users to not have to give away their passwords. Wow. So the it was a like the thing that centralized control and ended up shutting down the open nature of Twitter was meant to empower users so that they didn't have to give these third parties the app developers. Like, and the same thing we have now with Nostra where we have to figure out better ways to not hand over NSEX yeah. and oh, private yeah. keys. Yeah. But we're not, we don't, like, we don't have a server that's got a registry of accepted public keys. No. And so because we don't have that and we don't have an app key that next to connect it, we're not, we're not, inadvertently reintroducing this system of control. Yeah. And OAuth, which was supposed to empower users, ended up being the central way in which Web 2.0 companies consolidated power. And it's deeply ironic that it was created by Blaine Cook as a way of decentralizing power and empowering users. I think it's often the way someone would create a tool out of altruism. And yeah. then they don't see, I mean, Oft, I mean, often what we do say in the Bitcoin world, it's it's like a double-edged sword. You're making it to bank someone who's unbanked, but then in that same, you know, you're, you're empowering some like oligarch or something, you know, to move money without um, any oversight. Um, and often you just you don't see the other side of the of the the technology you're building, um, which is a real shame. But do you think so? That's something. I think to me, Nostra, part of the energy and part of why I think we're all excited about it is. Uh, it, it, it feels like it would be it would be hard for it not to succeed by its momentum, by the amount of projects involved in it, by how far how well it's performed so far, um, and then by all of its you know possibilities. Uh, do you see anything? What what what, what could possibly happen to to stop Nostar and for it to be corrupted? Is there anything we need to kind of keep an eye on? Like. Is there oh, there's a bunch of things. It's okay. So I can't see anything. So I know. So so this is a this is a fantastic <laughs> question. So. I don't think Nostra's success is guaranteed in any way. Um, I think Noster uh, nearly died a couple months ago when there wasn't paid relays and the relays were by default open and got overwhelmed with spam. Mm. That could have been like, oh, this is just, you know, I think uh, how we handle bridging to the Fediverse, 
because there now are a bunch of activity pub bridges, that's going to be another thing. Like, there's this monster which bridges to Truth Social. Can we make it so that users who want to see the Truth Social stuff can see it, and those Truth Social people can't go around trolling and silencing other people's speech who don't want to see them? Mm. I think if people see Noster as only a Bitcoin thing, yeah, that's bad. Then it will end up in in a niche because you know lots of people use Minds, lots of people use these. You know, you can get tens of millions of users and not change the world. Um, I think. If it's too slow, if the relays aren't acceptable, I think if we don't address the abuse reporting in a way that Apple and Google like, then there won't be Noster apps in the App Store, and uh, it can't succeed in the same way. So I think I think that there's technical problems. I think there's scaling problems. I think there's a lot of social problems, and then there's positioning problems, and the Noster needs to not be a Bitcoiner place. Yeah, it needs to be a place where, where yes, the Bitcoiners are there, and yes, they can use Lightning, but when you join, most people don't care about Bitcoin. No, they're not finding. They need to find their people. This is my issue with the Zap thing. Almost that I don't know. It's cool when people in our community are enjoying it very much, seeing the technology applied in such an interesting, innovative way, and actually the. You can then think of like you know paywalled content and stuff which could be on Nostra as well. So it opens up a whole bunch of new possibilities, um, and it lends itself well to technology. But for that initial first user, they open it up and they're like, "Oh, it's, this is one of these Bitcoin things for those far right Bitcoin people." Yeah. And then it's such a shame because it's 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 downplaying all the great work which all these developers have done who who are, you know aren't Bitcoiners. You yeah. Know? Um, so it shouldn't be some it shouldn't be something which is uh, expected. Because. You know, that's if someone thinks about, like, if someone, like, for a Bitcoin maximalist, yeah. what you want is actually people who don't care about Bitcoin to be able to just use it for the transactions and the tips and everything else and never have to think about it, never have to understand it, yeah. never have to care about it, and certainly not care about the politics of Bitcoin. No. Yeah. So I think that, like, when you, open my app, No Social, we've actually picked uh, a bunch of people to show up in the extended like extended feed thing that it, it pre-pulls. Yeah. And we, you know, we have Jack and Edward Snowden and a oh, few so other you people. Try, you try to be quite neutral in the people you No, pick. we're not neutral at all. We, we specifically are constantly looking across Noster and finding active users who are not Bitcoiners. Yeah, good and have a diversity of different views and perspectives and stuff. And we put them as like suggested followers in there in that extended feed. Yeah. And then you can choose, you can choose any relay you want. You can change the settings. Like it's not locked down, but, and people join and they're like, oh my God, this is such a different community than what I saw when I joined Domus and saw the Domus relay. Yeah. Which like Will's Domus is great. It's been super important. I respect it. We're, you know, I use it every day. But what we wanted to do was help people find their own contacts, their own communities, have a privacy-preserving way of saying who who do I know who's already on Noster? Mm. You know, intersecting Bloom filters or you know zero, zero knowledge proofs, things like that, so that they're finding other communities. Mm. You know, I went to a forum on Black Twitter, and it was a 20 people in a room trying to decide what to happen now that Jack was no longer and you know the you know the management team mm. that was very sympathetic to African Americans. God yeah, that puts them those those sorts of communities and groups, it puts them in a like, really tricky position. That was there. like like before Elon trust. Musk took over. Yeah. They had black people who were in senior positions at Twitter. Yeah. They had access to say, this is a problem. They had people who were working there because they really cared about it, and those people aren't there anymore. Yeah. And so they've lost their space. Yeah. And I want them to be able to build their space on Noster, and I want it to not be, you know, rented. Mm. I want, you know, like, 
one of the things I was saying, I was like, you know, they walk in the room and they feel don't don't pick a new owner. No, don't pick a new owner of your space. Don't pick a new like landlord. Build a system that that you can be your own landlords, that you can own that space. And so they they need to be able to have space by which like, yes, there are black Bitcoiners. Yes, there are people who are doing lots of organizing that space. There were, you know, a bunch of black people here at Nostrica. But the the dominant culture of, of the folks I was meeting with young white dudes, like the mo- yeah, they're young white dudes here, <laughs> and um, you know people need to be able to find themselves, yeah. and people really join social networks and social media platforms because of affinity and who's they're there. We don't actually join because of how the software works. Like people did event organizing on Instagram when Instagram had no event support whatsoever and wouldn't even show you in a timely way, mm-hmm. but that's where their people were. Yeah. So we need we need a way in which people can find their people. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, it is a commons, and there is the tragedy of the commons. So it wants to centralize, um, uh, just as you know, Bitcoin is a commons, but it tries to centralize over certain ideas. So it tries to be nuts. But the, did you know the the story of the tragedy of the commons? Go on. So the tragedy of the commons is the the most cited paper in economics. Yes. And it's a parable. It's not. Like it it's not says, necessarily going to happen. No, no, it doesn't. It, like it says it in there, like in the paper. This is not based on evidence or research, mm. and it's actually an ideological document that advocates for state or corporate ownership of public spaces. Mm. Eleanor Ostrom, one, first woman to win the Nobel Prize for Economics, looked at that paper and said, I'm going to research this subject. And what she found was that there are commons that are a tragedy. There are ones that fall apart, and there are ones that don't work. Mm -hmm. Um, There are cases in which it doesn't work. But there are actually millions of examples of successful common economic resource pools that aren't owned by anyone but are self-managed. And she has this, she's passed away now, but she has this, eight characteristics of a commons that is well managed and the rules are specific you have to have permission from the sovereign state or the sovereign power to exist you have to have the ability to have you know transparency and accountability and um, the ability to audit other people's work and the ability to have nested sets of rules and what we have in digital spaces we have lots of commons mm. like the, we, we built a lot of them. oh yeah no that's absolutely and um it's a model that works and it's a model that gives us an an alternative to the state or simply corporations owning it mm. yeah no i mean it's 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 one of the things that drives me towards free and open source and i think it's why yeah it's, it's the world can be a better place we can't even imagine software there. that wasn't created as a commons no. Could you imagine building anything without open source software? Yeah, no, I know it's bizarre. Like, yeah. it, it is unimaginable to think of, of programming yeah. at all without open source technology. And for, for production, it's it's something which lends itself very well to being a commons. And like yeah. physical production gets a little bit more complicated with cops and stuff. It's a little bit harder to structure, but um, it's it's amazing how copyright uh, copy left the impact. It has had on you know the, the future's potential to, to have common spaces um, and the technology and communication yeah. protocols. Like we run the entire global economy and society on a technological infrastructure that yeah. is created and maintained as a commons. Yeah. Like. So that can't. It's, it's only ever going to impact it, surely. And and Bill Gates in the early 1980s argued hard against the idea of a commons being viable. Yeah. Like his letters to people about and suing people about using basic without licenses and, yeah. and their whole campaign against the Free Software Foundation and everything else argued that the commons couldn't work and yeah. that you had to buy all your libraries and everything else. And that like that's done. Like we can't even think about it. And yet when we talk about a social media commons yeah. or, you know, a, an economic commons or other things like that, we think, oh, my God, how could that possibly work? When we're the very people who are contributing to the largest commons that has existed in well, I mean, this human is, history. To me, as so much of a lefty within the Bitcoin community, this yeah. is something which I've, I've, I've been screaming to my blue in the face at, at Bitcoiners forever when they're 
the Austrian econ type, you know. Yeah. Um, like, look, you're building a commons. Like, this is a freedom of association, a money commons, which anyone can have access to. Um, which doesn't mean you don't have businesses and don't make money. No, no, that's absolutely, yeah. It like, means, commons is not anti-capitalist. No, no, not at all, no, no. Um, it, you're, you're less likely to have a huge monopoly or corporation. Exactly. But, you don't have monopoly rent extraction. But then that's something they find hard to, 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 fix, to conceptualize as well, that there's different forms of private capital. Yeah. Um, um, there's like, you know, your small to medium enterprise in a town benefiting its community has contact with its employees. Um, that's a completely form of, different form of capital than some big, huge old corporation where uh, the people who run the corporation are detached from the people on the shop floor. Um, so, yeah, no, absolutely. And Nostar, again, itself, there's so many opportunities for very viable companies to come in and make, you know, fortunes, I think. Yeah. If Nostar works. That's how yeah. <laughs> and and that, that, I mean, I run a business. Yeah. We have investors. I'm building on Nostar because I want to run services and I want to build software and I want to make money. You know, I, I am personally, politically, an anti-capitalist anarchist, but I run a business and we exist in a capitalist system and I am going to use those resources and... Try and do business in a nice way. <laughs> yeah, do a nice way. We're a public benefit corporation. We have accountability to it. We can, we can legally prioritize the environment and our workers and society equally to the profit, but we don't get to play unless we make profit. Yeah. Like, we are gonna, we're going to create value and we're going to make profit and we're going to we're going to make money. Yeah. And I want other people to be able to make money. And one of the difficulties in Scuttlebutt is it had a bit of a hipster, you know, cooler punk vibe where they were very trusted <laughs> they were very distrustful of the idea of making money at all. Yeah. So it's very odd for me to go from one protocol to another that are very very similar. Yeah. But the ideas about making Gazi business are opposite. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Rabble, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed the conversation. And I'm really excited that there's such, no, it's not social, I think it's going to be such an important platform. And you, you understand that you know, it, we shouldn't entangle Bitcoin and Nostar too much, that Nostar should be its, its own thing, um, which Bitcoin may be a part of, absolutely. But it's great to hear that that's something which you're concerned about as well, because then you'll, you know, with your platform, it'll, um, uh, it'll be Nostar, you know? Well, yeah, absolutely. I, I, and, I'm, and I'm super excited coming out of Nostrica, getting to meet everyone in person. And um, I don't expect everyone to agree with me. I don't expect everyone to, ha to, to, to follow the nips that we write or to use it in this way. Yeah. But I think that in order for Nostar to succeed, uh, it needs to be open to people like myself yeah. and many others to join so that we can build a much larger world. Yeah. And um, I've been very pleasantly surprised at how open, you know, there's been some pushback, but most people have been open to this idea and wanting to build this plural, diverse ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I mean, this is, I think, what blew me away the most about meeting yourself and then from what you know, interaction I've had with Jack as well. It's like, these are my people. Like, these are the people we would hang out with in a hack day, uh, uh, you know, like a lightning hack day or in like Chaos Community Congress, Computer Congress or something. Like, these are technologists interested in technology and uh, 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 you, you, it, it's great to have you. So, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Like, like, to talk about Jack, like, when Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson and there were, like, serious Black Lives Matter protests, Ferguson is in St. Louis where Jack grew up. He got on a plane that day and flew back to St. Louis and didn't tell any press people and didn't tell any journalists and just didn't bring any security or anything else. And he just said, I grew up here. I care about this. Mm. And he just walked and like people recognized him. Mm. And so, you know, uh, Jack can show up to all those Black Lives Matter protests and he can be interested in Bitcoin. Yeah. And I think that what people who are in the Bitcoiner community to realize is that there needs to be a diversity. Oh yeah. yeah. And well, if they want, if they want. no one is right. Like I know no. my politics are wrong. I know that I make mistakes and I have biases and I know that everyone else does too. Well, cause you know, if you go back 200 years, then whatever the common 
you know, sense of that time. Right now, now we look back at it and it's complete nonsense and everyone yeah. was wrong. Yeah. Even the people who were almost like the most bright, they were still very wrong and we, we can only assume that of ourselves. And, and, <laughs> and, and in a hundred years, we will have all sorts of ideas and beliefs that will be considered insane. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just wanted to find out, like, the, 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 so I had this, um, I watched this interview years ago with Jack Dorsey, and in it he was talking about when he first started doing messaging between a computer and a phone, I think. Mm -hmm. And like, he was in Central Park, and he sent the message from his computer, and maybe it ping-ponged, uh, and he thought it was really cool, but then no one else really cared about it. I think it was him who told, told this story. And I remember, because now when in my head, um, when I think of Jack Dorsey, I think, well, he is, you know, he's a, he's a Nostadork. Like, yeah. He's the sole person who's going to get dorked out by the technology. Cause that's, oh, yeah, yeah. He's, so, he's totally a dork. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so that's, I think I've always had a lot of time for him from, 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 from watching that interview. So is that an accurate story? Was so, so, one, remember, this is all like 15 to 20 years ago. Yeah. So, like, all of our memories are fallible. Jack worked at a company that did bicycle messenger dispatches. And so he had the idea of what if, what if those, you know, and the bicycle messengers, like, they, they were using radios. So there was a database that, like, keep track of who was doing what, but they would radio out to, develop, to people. And uh, the messages from the bicycle messengers in dispatch were these status updates. I'm at this street corner. I'm doing this thing. I'm, you know, okay, package delivered. And then, you know, okay, who has, who can go from like Times Square to, you know, the financial district in New York? And uh, he was like, well, what if those messages were uh, not really text status updates, but almost like um, just ephemeral updates of everything that's going on? What music I'm listening to? Uh, where am I? Um, what's the heat? You know, did the door at my house unlock? You know, all those kind of things. Mm. And the, the text message part of it actually comes from a project called TextMob that uh, was an MIT Media Lab project to build text message alert and collaboration over text message for protests. Mm. And so that was the, the uh, it was actually my work that brought in the how do we send text messages, how do we receive text messages. Mm. Um, because Jack's one was like radios and computers and stuff because it was a couple years earlier. Mm. And that one was closed groups. So it was closed groups of, I had to join a group, and those groups could be broadcast groups, where everybody, you send a message and it goes to everybody else, so like 10 people. You send one text message, it goes to 10 people. And we used that in 2004 at the Republican National Convention in New York, and we sent tens of thousands of text messages out throughout the four days of the protest saying where the police were and where the protests were. And like one was like uh, the, the giant dragon sculpture at, on Fifth Avenue has caught fire, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. Um, but it was hard to sign up yeah. and uh, you couldn't follow individual people. And that part actually comes from Ev and the blogger team where they're like, what if there was something that was like writing a blog, but also like reading a blog. Mm -hmm. And so to me, if you look at where Twitter comes from, it's like the dispatch stuff mm -hmm. and the status updates. Absolutely. The, the text alert stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then also the, the blog like stuff of reading and writing and being able to choose who you follow without having to follow them. Yeah. That asymmetric part. Yeah. And so the, the, the brilliance is it's like, combining a bunch of different things together and um, hacking it together and like thinking about things of, in a hacker way. Yeah, no, so cool. Okay, okay, so it was, it sounds like it was an accurate story. And mm -hmm. I love the fact that, yeah, we just, someone into telephony and yeah. um, just generally being a dork. There was, so there was this, there was this software called Asterisk. Oh, I love Asterisk, man. Don't I was started. so into Asterisk. I, I released Asterisk libraries oh. and Perl. I, I went to the Asterix PPX conferences. The time, which was the, the Asterix, like the I UI went to the Asterix, Asterix conferences and gave talks and released software for that. So, yeah. like, we don't we're, talk yeah. about that now, but that's what we were doing in our spare time, yeah. hacking on yeah. on audio yeah. that convinced us that there was something to do with phones that would be fun. Wow. And like, Odeo ended up not using Twitter ended up not using any of the Asterix voice, like actual calling stuff. Yeah. But but 
Yeah, that was you what cut, we were that's playing. That's why you with. cut your cloth and had all yeah, the, the ideas, yeah. create the synapses in your brain for what then later became Twitter. Yeah. All right, that's nice. As a fellow telephony dog, that's nice to hear. Oh yeah, <laughs> we are so into asterisk. We're still on like the the yay mailing list, I think. The yeah. other telephony, whatever it is, um, and I still get messages. I still haven't just deleted it from my email thing. Uh, so yeah, kind of keep one foot in there. So you know, one of the things that we talked about last night at the bar, actually, I think is worth mentioning for the podcast here is the story that you have about your involvement in Noster at the beginning. And oh yeah. You know, Jeff, you know, you work at the same company and No, we don't work at the same company. No, we've just always been we were always kind of shared the same spaces in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. We're like builders, we like playing around with the technology. Yeah. Um so there's a bunch of times where me and Fiat Jeff were kind of our cross paths. Uh our paths crossed even. Um uh, there was the Alan URL stuff, so uh quite early on I was like asking for us like I have a, a static QR code because I made these sweet machines which you could pay for sweets a small amount of sweets for using the lightning network but it had to have like a screen in order to show the invoice and I thought this is stupid like I should just be able to have a sticker like a QR code mm -hmm. and then the microcontroller is just checking to see if it's been paid um, and uh, so that me and my friend we kind of cobbled, cobbled together um, a, a, a version of that um, by hacking like a, a lightning wallet um, and then later on, at that exact same time, Fiat Jeff was working on an URL. So we kind of we kind of met probably through that. Um, and then I made a couple of projects. Like I made the first like LN URL withdraw like um, a faucet for which you could share with your friends on the internet. So that was quite popular. Um, and then because of that, because we were making all these little projects, it sort of made sense that we'd make a piece of software where we could we could build a little project and then easily share it with other people. So that's kind of partly where LN Bits came from was we suddenly get this like urge or dorkiness to like spend a few days in our, sh in a wherever, wherever we work and then knock out some, some functionality which you can do on Bitcoin on Lightning and then share that with people in a way where it just be like a click, you know, a few clicks and then you could, they could experiment with that software as well. Uh, so we worked on Allen Bits together pretty early on and then we worked on some extensions together and one of those extensions was something called Diagon Alley, which is a marketplace extension which, and the very concept was um, the resilience through you know, like a smart, smart client, dumb server. Um, the idea being that if you index a bunch of products just on a, a simple front end page and those products were pulled in and the merchant had keys and then the customer had keys as well, then if that market were taken out, then you could easily just spin up another market and then point those products at that thing and then have it indexed. Because you aren't dependent on the server. You, you aren't dependent on the server. You're not dependent on the server, yeah. But at that time, it was mm. still like that you would still have the server for the, the shop front end. But... Um, so like that was, I think that helped with Fiat Jeff, like developing this concept, this idea of, of Nostar. Mm. So when he said, I'll take a look at this thing I made, I was like, dude, that's, that's, you know, diagonal. And he's like, yeah, it's got, you know, Wait, some so influence. Tell me, where were you when you first saw like the... It was during COVID. So, um, yeah, we were working on this stuff. I was in Scotland on an island in Scotland. Um, and, uh, yeah, I remember looking at it. I got... Uh, huh? Isle of Man? No. No, not the Isle of Man. It was the Isle of Mull. The Isle of Mull. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mull. Uh, but it was, it was when the COVID things happened, I, my, my partner's fairly asthmatic. I thought we needed to run away, go somewhere safe. And, yeah. and we had a great old time, to be honest. We just drank whiskey and ate lobsters. But um, uh, while I was... So a brilliant way, place to run away from <laughs> yeah, the global great. pandemic. Yeah, what does an excuse to run away because it was, it was good. Um, but you know, it's quite a productive time because, uh, yeah, well, we've, we've had a lot of time on the hands, obviously. And that's when we made Alan Bits. That's when I made Diagon Ali. Uh, that's when the Nostar thing sort of happened. Then pretty early on, um, we so I got really excited about it, um, and then I built the first sort of Nostar Twitter clone, where I literally t cloned Twitter. Um, but it's kind of buggy, but it worked. You know, you could post, and then you could do a DM, and then that's why I made the NIP4 for the DMs for the Nostar clone of Twitter. And Fiat Jeff was like, I don't want DMs on, the, on Nostar. And now they're, now they're used all the time. Now they're used all the time because they're useful. Um, he was probably just trolling me at the time, to be fair. <laughs> He is a real troll. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's hilarious. Yeah. But he, uh, I, I thought I'd piggyback off all the, um, all the research groups that Twitter had probably done on the, on the spacings of those three columns. And because there's like weird ratios, like 23 yeah. and a bit, 48 and a bit, whatever it is. Uh, and I thought, okay, I'm just going to really just replicate Twitter. So I replicated Twitter and it kind of worked okay. And then uh, Fiat Jeff merged in something where it was just like a third, third, third. And then I was like, why did you do that? And he's like, oh, because, you know, 
And I wanted to, so I, I reverted his merge. <laughs> and you should never revert VHFs, one of VHFs merge. Because no. then he just yeah. forked it and he went off and he turned it into Brannel, uh, which is a great project. Um, and was like the. Wait, can, we, can we just say that again for all the listeners? What's that? What never to do? Never revert one of VHFs merges. Yeah. Uh, you've been warned. <laughs> yeah. And then he went off and he made, uh, um, turned it into Brannel. Um, and that was a great project. Um, it has got some database issues now, but I really want that to come back as a project just because I was involved in the you know, yep. lineage of it. Um, and then I didn't really do much after that. I talked about it a lot. I kind of sort of discussed the Uber idea, uh, putting Uber on Nostar. I, I, um, I, I pleaded with the community for someone to buy Nostar.com and uh, no one did. So after about a month, I ended up buying it, um, uh, which actually was like the most expensive domain I've ever bought, even though Nostar wasn't a thing then. I think it's because of the, maybe the size of the name or something. Um, but it's it's damn lucky that some squatter didn't get it or some yeah. you know some somebody wanted to make a Noster token and like doing like yeah. a fake ICO around it. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what that was my fear. But it was like four grand, so I had to sell a whole Bitcoin at that time to get the to get the domain name. So, um, and it was like you say, absolutely well worth it. And then we did a like a hack day. Uh, I think it was around Christmas time. No, what, what it year? was the Online Chaos Communication Congress because uh, that wasn't running that year. Oh, yeah. So I did it. We did. Is a this 21? No, no 20. Cause, 20, I guess. Because oh, wow. there was a year it was cancelled. 2019, I went. Oh, nice. And that was the one where <clears throat> Moxie gave the talk where he pissed everyone off by saying you can't do decentralization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And um, David Graeber, who wrote the book Debt, yeah. gave his last big talk. Oh, wow. gosh. Because oh, and uh, I missed that. That he, he died during the pandemic, yeah, and his last like big public speech was then because then what everything locked down. What was that on? Um, it was on on bullshit jobs and like what do we like? Yeah. Yeah, you read that book. What a yeah. great book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so at, at that event for the yeah. for the Bitcoin assembly, we did a panel on Nostar. Um, and, what 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 Nostar is and its potential. Uh, we made this really really goofy awful video, and as f immediately after recording it, we was like, we online. "No." <laughs> <laughs> immediately after recording, you it, cannot it, find it. It's not online. Anywhere, don't don't search. Look. We were like, "That was really shit. Let's delete that immediately." Good. It was what? Did you say delete? Yeah, we were going to delete it immediately, and then and then, nice. <laughs> and then but then we didn't, and then for a while that was like the video which people went to when they wanted to learn about Nostar. So. Um, and then I did a talk about it in uh, Parallel Polis, HTCP. I did um, one of, in Bitcoin, we have uh, Pete McCormack. He's got this What Bitcoin Did podcast. Uh -huh. I spoke a lot um, on there about um, Nostar as well. Uh, it was quite funny because <laughs> I had this like, Uber idea. And then after a few weeks of talking about it, I thought this would be really good for sex Wait, work. Sorry, just in a nutshell for the listeners, Uber idea. So the, it would be that you have a taxi client and then a customer has a customer client. And then you just share your geolocation as an event. And I, I want a taxi. And then you have a map and you know, you use I don't know, open street maps or something. And you could very easily build like a, an Uber experience, which and anyone could use. And like, like now I could just, I've got a few hours spare and I've got a car, I, I want to be a taxi. Oh, so for much more ad hoc. Yeah, it could be yeah. ad hoc or it could be professional. And then it, we need to crack the reputation stuff. But once yeah. we crack that, something like that would be possible. Um, and in that discussion, we were thinking of other geolocated services. And I was thinking, well, for sex workers, this would be great also. Because you have reputation on both sides of the for the customer, for the client, and the and the the merchant. Um, and and people want privacy, but they need reputation. Yeah, exactly. They want privacy, so they can have a separate key pair, and then they could build up that reputation. Um, and once they build up that reputation, maybe the sex worker could charge more money, or maybe the they would only see people who've got a certain level of reputation. Um, so I thought it was a really interesting system, and actually thought that it, very powerful. Like it could really empower. Because it would stop. It'd be it made, more people independent as well, probably, um, as sex workers who wouldn't be relying upon a pimp. So I was, I was thinking this is a powerful idea. It took me about two or three weeks to get there from Uber, you know. But anyway, I did the Peter McCormack uh, uh, podcast and I explained the Uber thing and I said, and can you think of another industry where this is relevant? And he went, sex work. And it took yeah. him like, well, it took me three weeks. It took him like 0 0.3 seconds to go from Uber to <laughs> sex work. Funny. You're, you're, you're talking about like how Nostra came about reminds me that these protocols don't become successful in any technology, especially open source technology, don't become successful 
because of the, just the technology itself. The technology has to work, but it's actually the people who go around and talk about it and build community around it and do engagement around it. So there's a, a protocol called ChatterNet, which is nearly identical to Nostr. Hmm. But uh, the message types are activity stream message types. But uh, the rest of it's, you know, all the same. They're not Bitcoiners, but everything else. But the, the reason that Nostr is taking off is because there are people who are going around, mm. having podcasts, talking on video, talking at conferences, yeah. writing it up, sharing it, tweeting about it, and basically doing evangelism and community organizing. Yeah. And we forget that that's important. And that's going to continue to be important because each community that joins needs to have people who are evangelizing and decide that they need to get people on it and push it forward. Mm. And then for that, for that, for their own community and in the context yeah. and framework and lens of their own community as exactly. well. Exactly. One yeah, of the things nice. that I, I mean, that's been one of my most, I think, like popular, well-received kind of like aphorisms or mantras yeah. is that if you're talking about like community technology, right? So we're talking about like a thing like Allied Media Conference, right? Like that type of level of conscious technology creation is that like as a mental model, people need to realize that 10% of the effort is the tech. Mm. You know, the design, the, the the, the bits and, you know, the code and whatever. And then 90% is all of the socio-cultural relationship building and the informal time, grabbing dinner together, going to conferences, ha making time to hang out with each other. Mm -hmm. Like, that's, like, that's the big value of the Allied Media Conference is it's a giant sort of, like, uh, community get-together where there's all this cross-pollinating and it's a and It's a melting pot, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, and a real sharing of ideas. Yeah. And uh, everyone I've spoken to, I've, I've come away and I've gone, oh, there's a thing I need to build. Yep. Yeah. Like, oh. Well, and so the thing that I've people see it, people get it quickly. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. means, yeah. But the other thing that's interesting is that it's like it, this it that we're talking about with Noster is like, so you had a hand in part of the work that you've done. It's also inspired by Scuttlebutt. And it's like, it, it, is it, it is itself a potpourri or a bouillabaisse uh, or yeah. a melange or a chili or pick your, pick your cuisine metaphor. Yeah. You know, it's not it's not something that was just made, you know, tabula rasa out of, you know, Fiat Jock, you know, while he was surfing in, on the beach. Yeah, you know? yeah. Absolutely. And, and nothing, nothing actually comes. Right. No. Like, all ideas, all innovation comes from communities of people. Yes, individuals do the work, mm -hmm. but uh, calculus was invented twice at the same time by two people who weren't talking to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, multiple people came up with the theories of evolution. Um, technologies and culture has a time and it's actually the community of people getting together and talking and experimenting that causes innovation. And what the internet does and what open source does is it lets us collaborate together across borders in so much faster and so much more fluid way. Whereas before you had to be in the same city and go to the same like clubs or bars or universities and now we you know we came from all over the world for Nostrica because we found it throughout all these different networks including you know a lot of people here came because they were Bitcoiners but there were a ton of people here yeah. who were not Bitcoiners at all and, and some a, of them were from like legacy traditional some legacy traditional industries mm -hmm. yeah um, where the, the their company have just got the foresight to send them to on a, to a conference of this new emerging technology which is obviously has some power in it you know um, and I, I thought that was very insightful of those companies to send someone along to the conference to try and figure out what this Nostar thing is mm -hmm. and a bunch of Nostar developers weren't Bitcoiners like yeah. most were but but there's been a bunch of people who were just like all right I thought it sounded cool I met, I met, I met a BSV guy when, uh, when yeah. we were there so uh, and that's kind of a controversial you know, subject within the Bitcoin world. But there was part of me as I was speaking to him and I was like, God, God, we need some alternative you know, ideas in, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. in, in Nostar. You need space for that diversity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, if they want to use it, cool. Like it should be, they should be able to. Like, you know, and in, there's all this anthropological research on communities of practice, hmm. right? And that's kind of what we're talking about. Like a commons or open source culture is a community practice about the commons. And most any of the commons in Eleanor Ostrom's work they're communities of practice who are maintaining, right? So a lot of the work is, like, no one likes to talk about maintenance, right? That's like the unsexy, boring thing to talk about, but that's a lot of what it is, is these are code bases that are merged, 
or port, mm. and then they're maintained, and then some of them die off because they stop being maintained. I mean, often, so like with, with, with what we do with Alan Bits, like it's been popular, it's been mm -hmm. successful, and it's gotten popular because we have like an amazing community of people. We have like a couple of thousand people on our Telegram group, and that like right, right now, I could go on my phone and they're all helping each other. Like mm -hmm. someone has an issue, they pop in, and it's this sort of environment where you, you can ask this. We get asked the same dumb question like hundreds of times, but they, there'll always be someone who answers them in a really nice, considerate way because they know that, you know, within a month's time, there might be a contributor. You know, they're just at that beginning of yep. their journey. Um, and from what I've seen of, uh, and I've seen a bunch of great software projects and, and great companies as well, which have built software and they, they've had no community, they've had no community outreach. They've had this kind of vanguard. Elite, that is so much harder than the tech. Yeah, the oh, community is, is so much harder than the tech. It's it's, it's kind of because the tech you just you sat down and you're in your own space and you're just grinding away, and then you have to kind of get up and do something to engage the community, don't you? And and, and produce podcasts or, or videos or whatever or workshops or go to conferences. Um, but when you have some companies and they'll or some projects and they'll have this kind of technocratic vanguard um, attitude towards their users, like if you can't understand this thing, then it's because you shouldn't be using it. And I think that happens sometimes in software projects and sometimes in the, the sort of toxic free and open source mm -hmm. culture, which can happen. Um, and yeah, I can the, see the how RTFM it happens. The RTFM culture of like you show up, you ask a question, instead of someone connecting to you and, yeah. and answering that mm. same stupid question, they were apparently, you know, RTFM, read the research. fucking manual and go, you know, yeah. go off and solve it yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's it just doesn't get them anywhere, these projects. And it's, um, uh, uh, I think it's important, because we've done it a few times where we've almost picked up some of that toxic culture, you know, because you're working hard, then someone asks you a silly question, and you're like, well, why don't you understand it? What's wrong with you? You shouldn't be using it. But, um, uh, no, I think that's the vibe I'm getting in Nostar is it's the sort of environment where you could ask a dumb question. And if you're putting in a little bit of effort, say if you spent like, you've tried to make something, you spent a few, few days trying to make it, and you ask them a dumb question, like you're going to get help. Someone's going to help you. Um, so I think we keep that, it being a very welcoming environment for developers and as not having like a, a, a you know, like that, that sort of toxic attitude towards yeah. users. Sometimes with developers, it's like they really just don't like users. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well and, and that's that's why there actually needs to be in in reality there needs to be businesses in the space yeah. that are able to employ people who are designers, who work with usability, yeah, who talk well. to customers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, as opposed yeah. to programming for programmers. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, the design thing's always funny because so many so many developers hate designers. I always think it's because the designers care about the users. And then the developers hate the users, so the developers hate the designers. <laughs> well, and so this, this is a big corollary with modern architecture and, and urbanism that I, that's part of where my digital work is coming from is it's the same modernist mentality. Like architects are not trained on usability or sociocultural research on who's using the building. The award system, the prizes, are all about the aesthetics. Mm. It's basically like massive egos who want to build, who's building like gigantic sculptures, art mm. sculptures. And then they're just competing for each other on what's cool, which in some developer cultures that that same way, and that's how you get like these esoteric languages mm. that are technically really fascinating, but they're not that practical. No, they are missing out on certain you know realities of software development life cycle management. Or like, why do I have a list of twenty lightning wallets that I could use in Domus? Yeah, <clears throat> like because it's fun to build your own, and uh, but. None of them are, you know, like very few of them are focused on the needs of most users. But then, but then it's funny because I mean, the, I was saying Lightning, the, the most successful one is Wallace Toshi, uh, and all it is is they've just been designed first over the other wallets, and they've just kept it simple, yeah. and they've got a nice design. They get some nice feedback when you get a payment, um, and it's it's funny that another, the other wallets haven't picked up on their. Why, on that as being why they've been successful. Yeah. Well, and it's still design is a, a newer sort of discipline or digital design in the way that we know it. Yeah. Whereas engineering is kind of so similar of any kind. The engineering mentality in human culture is very ancient. Yeah. Right? So it's a much more practice tradition. Whereas user interface or design is at that level is kind of like a higher order in the uh, stack. You know, because it's mm. more abstracted. It's even more abstracted than. than yeah, you're right. It's not just from software, is it? it goes and bleeds into other yeah. industries and then also I mean just engineering and science in general I suppose is yeah. can be a very toxic environment where you know the, the you know the think of the professor who doesn't doesn't want to do the lessons teach the lessons in the university he just yeah. wants to get on and you know 
write his research. papers and do his research yeah, yeah. and hates the students, so totally it's very similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so here's the maybe the last question that I have for the podcast because it is getting late in the day and the sun's about to hit us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We've got to get to that hot hack day at some yeah. point, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. maintain the pura vida. Uh, <laughs> so the last question is, for, so for you two as like seasoned engineers who've been in this for a long time and have gone through many utopic moments, um, one of the you know kind of things that's happening now for me as a you know, as a product manager you know as a product lead here at NOS is it really is something different. Uh, it reminds me so much of the deja vu of the early web days when we were conscious of the protocol. Mm. Is what does it mean to be doing product development in an era where now there's hyper consciousness about the significance of protocol, whereas for the past twenty years it was like there was just one protocol, right? It was like web the web stack for the most part. I mean, there are other things going on too, but just the dom the dominance of the web stack and the protocol stack around that was what everyone just built on top of and didn't question it. Other than those of us that were there at the very beginning, where we we were involved in shaping the protocol through debates between the closed, you know, the, those that were focused on enclosure and those of us that were more on the open source side. But what advice or thoughts or recommendations would you have? To people who need to understand that we're developing products in a in an era of very fluid, experimental, rapid protocol consciousness, and that seems like that's not going to go away now because we realize that the significance of designing protocols is now I think maybe here to stay. Uh, a couple a couple years ago, the IETF added a new stage to their standards, mm -hmm. and the IETF is my like favorite like standards body organization. It's a mess, but like they they. The motto is that we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. Nice. And uh, a few years ago, they actually changed it so that as part of getting a standard approved, you need to have a section of the standard, which is the social implications of what happens when this gets deployed. Wow. And that doesn't mean that it's all good, but at least says we're gonna to we're gonna think about this yeah. and we're gonna try and understand what happens when we build this and when people use it and that it reflects the change in society and the economy that we want. Mm. Because none of it's neutral. Mm. And so that that didn't exist. Ten years ago, what that didn't exist. Five did years ago, I, I don't remember. A couple years ago. A few years ago. Yeah. Um, what well, with with protocols, I think like if you're doing say computer science, that you want to have as most impact as possible, and then you create pieces of software, and then you realize that actually one of the ways in which you could have more impact is to contribute towards a protocol or come up with a new protocol, um, and then they're the they're the lasting frameworks. Which you know, if you look at just society in general over in history, like it's the protocols which have been the things which shaped the material world, you know, shaped the road systems or like how, or language or whatever. Um, so Pro protocols last forever. They last forever, exactly, yeah. And then you build things on them. So it's, it's I, I can see the appeal of, of trying to design protocols for, and then you yeah, have that interoperability then. Um, and then also refining protocols as well. And I think it's great that more and more people are like feeling comfortable reading protocol stuff. Um, and that's the real strength of Nosto as well. Is I mean, people have been complaining about complaining about there being too many too too many nips, mm. but to me that's like a, it's a sign of uh, the enthusiasm which is within the community. They're also remarkably short and yeah, concise. They're short, yeah, like this and, is not like like it takes you. You can read through them all in under an hour. Like, yeah. Like really. Yeah. Like there's a lot of numbers of them and whatnot, but the protocol is is incredibly concise. Yeah. And then not only that as well, like because uh, the we had the LNURL protocol, um, and in that process, I think that Fiat Jaff and then a couple of the others, um, they, they learned just how to arrange it in a way which was accessible to because in bit in our little Bitcoin world, my mates like that lot, we which we all kind of hung out in the same Telegram groups, we were the builders in the trenches building things. And then if you look at the LNUR protocol, it's a very bottom up kind of protocol. Like it wasn't from top down from the, the, the lightning uh, node uh, developers. It was from the, the bottom up, from the, the people building stuff, interesting applications. How do, how do we make it work? Yeah, how do we make it work? And how do we make 
cool things with it. And Eleanor Neurob was really good for that for that period of time. Anyway, they developed this wonderful program, very, very easy to read. And, and, and I think that, to me, the NOSA protocol is similar. The, the, the structure of the way it's being put together, it makes it pretty easy to read and but, it's accessible. So when, when OAuth was first written, the entire spec was like seven pages long. Yeah. And it would, you could implement it like, when, you know, I, it wouldn't even make sense to use a library. It was just like, okay, I'm gonna read the spec and, and build my own implementation. Yeah. Now we're gonna use the library. They were using the library because OAuth 2.0 came along and we let all these standards uh, astronauts come along and do things. And you see specs that are top down or bottom up. Yeah. And we have to be careful yes. that we don't let those standards people come in and like it's a way of capturing a space yeah. because they can come in and they'll be like, no, we're gonna do it proper. And they like they they they're good at structuring the text and they're really good at sitting through those boring fucking meetings and they don't write so much code. Yeah. And that's how Microsoft and Google and Apple and these other companies actually take over protocols. Is the rest of us are developing stuff or using it and spending a bit of time on the standards. Mm. But the big companies have entire divisions dedicated to people who work full time on standards. Uh -huh. And then they reshape those standards two, two ways. One, to the needs of the corporations and that, you know, their employers, but they never say it directly. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and they make it so that it is no longer like right now, it's easy to build Noster. You can build these clients, but they can make it so that the, it solves the needs of particularly large players that don't, that don't meet the needs of individuals mm. and make it harder and harder to implement and make it confusing. The DID standard, the decentralized identity standard, Jesus Christ, that's a long document. <laughs> and there's similar ones, like I'm super fan of, of message layer security but it's like this whole complete spec. When I look at message layer security, I look at the Peter Panda project, which wrote a several page paper that describes how you would implement it in short form. Then, and they, they're like, we're not gonna do all these weird edge cases and all this other stuff that makes it hard to implement. Mm. So we need to be very careful of the people who are like, it's not gonna just be a series of nips. It's gonna be just like one long document that, that that over specifies things. Mm. And I love the open nature of choose which NIPs you support. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the, the kind of open flakiness of the structure of each one. And um, if we get to the point where we let the standards people come in, yeah. and there are professional standards people who write prototype code, don't write production code, and all they do is they're really good at taking over standards meetings. Yeah. That's that's one of the ways in which Noster could well, the attack fail practice. into success. Yeah. And end up being sort of enclosed. But um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, it's been great. Cheers, Ravel. Yeah. Yeah, cheers. Thank you.